Brian, good morning. Everybody, get up on your feet. Give me some clap. Blessed be your name, the land that is plentiful, where the streams of abundance flow. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name, where I'm found in the desert place, and walk through the wilderness. Blessed be your name. Every blessing you pour out, I turn back to praise. When the darkness closes in, Lord, still I will say, Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glorious name. Shining down on me when the world's all as it should be. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name. We won't mark with suffering. The pain in the offering. Blessed be your name. Every blessing you pour out. I Turn back to praise when the darkness closes in love. Still I will say, Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glorious name. Am I on? Yeah. Okay. Good morning, Northside. It's 
so glad to see each of you here today. And for those of you that are online, we say good morning as well. I wanted to tell you a little bit about what we have going on because at Northside, we're actively loving people. So we are the church outside of these walls taking action to love on others. Previously, we had a group go to NACA. So just in case you are down or need a little bit of encouragement today, I would say, They are educating kids in math, science, all of those things, reading, but also about Jesus Christ. And it's in, it develops their whole life. They live on that campus, and they teach those kids, and they eat with those kids, and they worship with those kids. There are just amazing things happening there, so be encouraged. But coming up, we have next Sunday, so one week from today, July 18, we are going to be just down the road around the corner at Burton's Laundry. We're going to take the laundry mat and pay for laundry for anyone who comes in, wash, dry, help them bring in their laundry. We are doing that. We have a team of people going to do that. And then also coming up in August, Foster Love will be having its first back to uh, back at it post-COVID. We are just going to have an event that's all going to be outside. We're going to have a food truck and just provide things, foster parents to come and have a good time. Uh, so that is what we have going on, our activity in July and August. I'd like to uh, pray, so please pray with me. Dear Lord, we thank you for the activity. Thank you so much for the drive that we have and the people that we have going outside of these walls to just love you and love others. Lord, I pray that uh, you fuel all of that. And our attitudes and our motivations and all of that is completely pure, our hearts are pure and our eyes are set on you. Lord, I ask that you meet with us here today. I ask that your name be glorified in all that we do. Search us, Lord. Uh, give us a word from you. Give us a freshness uh, from you as we continue to worship you. And I pray. Thank you so much. down our idols and give us clean hands and give us pure hearts let us not lift our souls to another and give us clean hands and give us pure hearts let us not lift our souls to another
give us pure hearts. Let us not lift our souls to another. Give us clean hands. Give us pure hearts. Let us not lift our souls to another. Stand up here. I'm going to actually have everybody stand up again. Because <laughs> I've got to stand. That's the way this works, right? I don't get to sit down. All right.
the last few weeks, and it's growing on me in big ways. It's turning into one of my favorites that go through my head during the week. And this last year, even when we've been around other people, it's been really hard to not feel alone. Um, and the words of this song, along with the words of the last song, you know, I mean, um, you know, he's the God of wonders, and he holds us and tries to remind us that we're not alone. And I would encourage you just to kind of, when you're feeling alone, take a look around. Even if there's not another person there, there's probably something there, some sign from God that, hey, I'm with you. And I've had a few different times in the last week or two where I've felt a little lonely, like something I was going through was just me. Nobody else could possibly understand. And then God sends you somebody that says, hey, I'm going through. with us even when we don't feel it we're not alone and valleys His joy is refreshing Restores my soul Mercy and goodness Gives me a show Thank you. 
Well, good morning, church. Appreciate uh, those of you that have uh, been praying for uh, myself and my family, and uh, we are doing well, um, but uh, I want to just say thank you, and I want to just take a couple of moments here before we dive into Second Peter to um, pray for you. I know uh, you all have a lot going on, too, as well. Um, it has been a, a busy time, busy summer, believe it or not. We've had uh, a group, uh, as Michelle mentioned earlier, that's gone out to Arizona on a mission trip and has returned from Arizona on a mission trip. We've had somebody in our church, Candy LaPlace, who went to Africa on a mission trip and has returned from Af Africa on her mission trip. We've done our summer VBS right now down in Marion, Indiana. Our teen camps are going on. And uh, Pastor Dallas left, uh, I believe, last Monday, and I hope he returns uh, here in a couple of days. But uh, he's a great group of students that are down there, and we want to pray for them. Uh, 
is not feeling well and you have surgery coming up. And uh, I want to pray for you. I know there are also some of you that have been grieving the loss of a loved one. We want to uh, just, you know, remember uh, Steve Sears Jr., he lost his college roommate this past week. And so we just want to pray for Steve and for Julie and the rest of uh, this individual's family. I also want to ask you to pray for my wife. She got the news this morning, um, just an hour, and a hour or so ago, that her grandma passed away. And uh, so I want to ask you to lift up her, but I know there are others too. You've had loss that you've experienced recently of a loved one. And so if you'll just bow with me, whatever position you'd like to take, Tom. Okay. Okay. Well, we will pray for Tom McBride too as well. He's going to be having eye surgery. So would you just bow with me, church? And whatever posture is comfortable for you to pray, if you want to come up here to the altars, you're more than welcome to do that. You want to turn and kneel there in your pews, you're more than welcome to do that. But I want to just give us a moment to just quiet and still ourselves before God. And then I want to pray for us as a church, pray for you. Heavenly Father, we are so thankful to be your children, to be your sons and your daughters. We know you are good. We know that you love us. We pray for your kingdom to come, for your will to be done on earth as it is in heaven. We pray for that daily bread. Lord, I don't know what kind of needs are represented here this morning with this body, but you do. For some, it may be spiritual, others emotional, physical. Lord, would you meet us right where we are at? And would you minister to us? Would we be aware of your constant presence? Will we see answered prayer as we turn our burdens and our requests over to you? Possible hip surgery here soon and also just dealing with some transition in her life with Wayne. I just lift up Sharon and Wayne to you and ask that, Lord, you just minister to them right where they are at. I pray for our brother Tom McBride and his upcoming eye surgeries that, Lord, those would go well and that, Lord, uh, whatever's needing to be done to, to correct something, that, Lord, it would help Tom and that you would just be with him as he waits for that and as he's trusting you in that. Lord, there are others here that are grieving. I lift up my, my wife, Trina, and her family and just ask that you would bring comfort to them as they grieve the loss of the grandma. And I, I pray for others here too, Lord, that have lost loved ones recently. I, I pray for Steve and Julie and some of their family and friends that lost a, a close friend this week. Lord, uh, would we turn to you in these moments and not necessarily uh, know that you're going to give us maybe a We just sung in this song, you are our shepherd and we are not alone. And I pray that we will trust that, we will believe in that, and that we will have strength from your presence with us. I thank you for this body. I thank you for the love that is here, the love towards others, the love towards you. Would we grow in that love? Would we be stretched and challenged in that love? I thank you for being a God that forgives our sins. I thank you for giving us the power to offer forgiveness to others when they wrong us. Would you help us tonight? And 
would we hold to the truth that yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. It's in your wonderful name that we pray this morning. And God's people said, Amen. Well, thank you, church, for praying, for continuing to pray, continuing to seek prayer. There's nothing wrong with waiting upon the Lord. And when we pray, we certainly learn to wait upon the Lord, don't we? Well, we are going to continue this morning a series that we started two weeks ago um, in the book of 2 Peter. If you have your Bibles, I want to ask you to open those into the New Testament towards the end of... And as you're turning there, there's a couple things that uh, I want to just remind you of in regards to 2 Peter and to what we are learning in this series. So here's the first thing. We're learning that we can experience lavish living by embracing our new identities in Christ and engaging in the spiritual disciplines. We're going to really talk about that this morning. Also, we are learning all about the book of 2 Peter, why it was written, and how to apply it to our lives. So, going with why 2 Peter was written, it was written to spur believers on to grow in their faith. We all need sometimes that kick in the pants, don't we, to grow to do something that maybe we don't want to do or that we're not naturally inclined to do. A lot of the letters of the New Testament were written to encourage believers to keep growing in their faith. That's one of the reasons Peter writes this letter. He wants those believers to keep their eyes on Jesus. He wants them to be anchored to Jesus, and he wants them to grow closer to Jesus. Another reason that 2 Peter was written was to call out false teachers that were among the church. Here in a few weeks, we're going to get to that. We're going to unpack what exactly is going on in this church and what exactly a false teacher is. We will get to that. And then finally, Peter wants to challenge believers to hold to the truth that Jesus It sometimes can be kind of challenging. It sometimes slips our mind. It sometimes becomes something that we think, well, it's probably not going to happen in my generation. I mean, it's already been 2,000 years. But Peter and those first century Christians, they lived with expectation that at any moment the heavens would be rendered, they'd be torn, and Jesus was going to return. I don't think there's anything wrong with living in that way. And if we're wrong and he doesn't return in our generation, then you know what? That's great news because that allows there to be more and more people a part of God's family. We'll learn, we'll hear from Peter that God's slowness, his waiting, his patience gives more and more and more people an opportunity to turn to him and to repent. His family grows larger and larger and larger. I want to remind you of those things. So what we're going to do here this morning is we're going to look at 2 Peter chapter 1. We're going to walk through verses 3 to 11. If you have your Bible, 2 Peter chapter 1. And we're going to begin right here with verse 3. And I'll put these verses on the screen for you too as well. I'm reading them from the New Living Translation. This is what God's Word says. By His divine power... God has given us everything we need for living a godly life. You can amen that. We have received all of this by coming to know him, the one who called us to himself by means of his marvelous glory and excellence. 
And because of his glory and excellence, he has given us great and precious promises. These are the promises that enable you to share his divine nature and escape the world's corruption caused by human desire. That'll preach right there. I don't even know if I need to say more, but I'm going to. I love the way Peter just dives right in. He, he gets right to the meat here on verse 3. By his divine power, we, we've got to acknowledge that Peter's referencing God. That by God's divine power, that he has given us everything we need for living a godly life. that we think we don't need are exactly the things that he's given us that we do need. Like a pastor. Y'all need a pastor. Even if I wasn't your pastor, I'd still say, you need a pastor. You need a church family. You need brothers and sisters around you that can encourage you. You need brothers and sisters of Christ around you that are further than you, that are further along in the journey, that have been there and done that. You also need new believers around you. You need old believers around you, young believers around you. You even need unbelievers around you. See, we do need things. We can't take this and say, you know what, hey, I've got everything I need, so maybe I don't need to show up for worship. Maybe I don't need a pastor. Maybe I don't need church. There's a lot of people. For our benefit, God has given you pastors for your benefit. By his divine power, God has given us everything we need for living a godly life. About a decade or so ago, I went to a Fort Wayne Tin Caps baseball game. It's a minor league baseball team similar to the South Bend Cubs. And it, it was sometime in July, sometime around the 4th. And I was really excited about this night because it was fireworks night. And so we endured the heat. We had seats that we got a great deal on, and we got a great deal on them because they were in the sun the entire game. But we endured the heat looking forward to that fireworks show at the end of the game. So when the game ended and the lights started to turn off, we, we looked down on the field, and here comes this hot dog cart being I said, are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? Because that looks like somebody went to Walmart, bought a couple of those big packages of fireworks that Walmart sells, and they're going to let them off from this hot dog cart. My mind was quickly changed when the show started. I mean, that I can't explain it to you, but somehow this little hot dog cart for like 15 minutes straight, not letting up one bit, let fireworks off that were amazing. It blew my mind. I, I want to get one of those hot dog carts. <laughs> there was a disproportionate amount of power in that hot dog cart to... Because if we are allowing God to live inside of us, to move, to work, to transform. I tell you what, there's a disproportionate amount of power available to us through that relationship with God and through allowing him, him to live in us. People might look at us and say, it's a hot dog cart, but boy, do we pack a punch. Boy, are we loaded with some fireworks. I think that's what Peter's wanting this church to hear. What he's wanting these Christians to hear is that you've got everything you need. God has equipped you. Peter goes on, he says, And because of his glory and excellence, he has given us great and precious promises. 
What are those great and precious promises that God has given us? Well, if we were to go into the Old Testament, we would read passage after passage after passage. Leviticus, Ezekiel, Jeremiah, the story of Exodus, where God promises to be with his people to live among them and to be their God. And there are even hints among the prophets that God is going to live among and in his people. That's one of the promises of God. We also have the promises of Jesus. Do you know the promises of Jesus? Jesus told Peter, the one writing this letter, Jesus told Peter that when I go, there's another that's coming, and he is going to be your counselor, your advocate. He is going to be with you, never going to leave you. He's going to power you up. He's going to fill you with my love. That's the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is one of the promises of God. I believe that's what Peter's talking about here. Because it's by His divine power, the only way we have everything we need is if God is living in us. And guess who lives in your church? The Holy Spirit, who is God. Listen to what he says. These are the promises that enable you to share His divine nature and to escape the world's corruption caused by human desires. Move on here to verses 5 and 7. Peter says, in view of all of this, make every effort to respond to God's promises. I love that Peter challenges this group, don't just sit around on your hands waiting for something. Don't just sit there thinking that this is just going to happen to you spontaneously. Just, you need to be doing something. Make every effort Peter says, supplement your faith, listen to this, supplement your faith with a generous provision of more. And self-control with patient endurance, and patient endurance with godliness, and godliness with brotherly affection, and brotherly affection with love for everyone. You know what Peter has done here? Peter has given us his own list of the fruit of the Spirit. We, we know Paul's list of the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians, but here's Peter's list of the fruit of the Spirit. I want to talk about these things with you. Let's start with the first thing he says. We're going to supplement our faith with what? With moral excellence. Maybe some of your translations say goodness. You translate this, it means virtues. Some in Peter's crowd would be familiar with Greek philosophy, and they might trace some of those virtues back to a certain philosopher like Aristotle or Plato. Because your philosophy and what you believe would trace it back to an idea, to a person, where Peter, on the other hand, do you know who Peter would trace his idea of what is morally excellent to? The person Jesus. Jesus Christ himself, who Peter lived with, who Peter ministered with, who Peter walked with. When it comes to this idea of what's virtuous, of what's pure, Peter has Jesus in mind. Because Jesus lived a life that was morally excellent. Jesus lived a life that was full of goodness, that was pure. The things that Jesus did, it wasn't for selfish motives or for selfish reasons. He did things because he was pure. He had the right motive. He's Peter's example. The next thing that we're challenged to add to our faith, to supplement our faith with, is knowledge. A lot of times in our world, we associate knowledge with information. If I just read this news article, watch this news station, I, I can learn this information. But a, a Hebrew way of understanding knowledge involves not just information, but a relationship. I don't just know about you, I know you. You see, you can know all about somebody and not know them at all. I mean, you could read a book about somebody, read their biography, read their Facebook post. You might know all about them, but do you really know them? Because that's a relationship. 
So we're challenged here to increase in our relationship, in, in that knowledge that we have of Jesus, that somehow the things we are learning about him, somehow they influence and they, and they somehow change and make for better our relationship with Jesus. To knowledge, we're to add self-control. We're to master our desires. If, if, you, if you have a desire that you do not have control of, you are a slave to that desire. That's what Scripture tells us. But we're called, we're called to a different standard. We're called to live differently. We're called to master our desires. We're called to show self-control. To that, there's patient endurance. This is loyalty. This is faithfulness to the doctrine that uh, the apostles were sharing with those early churches and to Jesus Christ himself. We're to be faithful and, and to be faithful to the church that we're a part of too as well. Holiness or piety. Again, Jesus being the ultimate example of that. And then to that brotherly love, brotherly love. You know, one of the things that Jesus tells his disciples in John chapter 13, verse 35, is that the world will know that you belong to me, that you love me by the way you love one another. This is a call to love those that are a part of the church, to love those that are in community with us. Whether we agree with them on everything or not, whether we vote the same way as them or not, we are called to love one another, and we are giving a witness to the world by the way we treat one another, church. And then finally, last but certainly not least, is love. Not just love for your neighbors that like you, that keep their yard mowed and trimmed and looking good next to your yard that's mowed, trimmed, and looking good, but also the neighbors on the other side who never mow their yard, who have several cars in their yard, who have animals running wild in their yard, who don't like you. We're called to love everyone. That's why we've made it our mission here at Northside to love Jesus and to love people because that's a pretty big endeavor. It's something we will be doing for the rest of our lives, learning to love Jesus and to love people. That last call to love includes everyone, the people you like, the people you don't like, and everybody in between. Here's what I like about this. As Peter wraps this up, Oh, I had a list there. I could have showed you that, but you're following along in Scripture. The more productive and useful you will be in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Think about that. If these qualities are increasing in your life, if you're growing in these things... Not that you've attained it, not that you could say, hey, uh, I, I don't need to grow anymore here, but you're pursuing these, you're seeking after these, you're running after these, you're trying to grow. You will be productive for the kingdom of God. But verse 9, this is what it says. Those who fail to develop in this way are short-sighted or blind, forgetting that they have been cleansed from their old sins. So for us to be effective, qualities that Peter lists, this fruit of the Spirit that Peter lists, and if we're willing to grow in these things and to pursue these things, I believe we will have a healthy church, and who doesn't want to have a healthy church? But in order to have a healthy church, we've got to be growing in these things. So how do we grow in these things? I've heard, I've heard pastors say that when it comes to faith, you're either growing up or you're growing old in your faith. Which one best describes you, church? Are you growing up in your faith? Are you maturing? Are, are you going further w w in your relationship and what you know about Jesus? Or are you growing old and stale? 
in your faith. You know, one of the things that 2020... For our own spiritual growth. We can't put that solely on a church or on a pastor. We got to do something about it. We got to take initiative so that we can grow up in our faith and not grow old in our faith. You know, those that grow old in their faith, they're usually bitter. Do you know anyone that's bitter? Don't look at them if they're here. But do you know anyone that's bitter in the faith? You know, bitter is just finely aged anger. I mean, it really is. It's finely aged anger. Something happened in your life. Something happened in someone's life. And instead of turning it over to Jesus, instead of offering forgiveness, which is a really easy way to move on from bitterness, we held on to it. And that bitterness causes us to story that we read this past week in the Northside Weekly in the Gospel of Mark chapter 6. Jesus returns to his hometown. Do you remember what Jesus' hometown was? What was it, church? Okay, Nazareth. Some of you got to wake up a little bit. It's Nazareth, all right? Jesus' hometown. And when Jesus returned to his hometown, the people got word that he was coming and they were excited. They put out a big banner up uh, above the main city streets that said, Welcome, Jesus. We are so happy that you are coming home. They had a big parade for Jesus. People came into the street. They even put one of those signs up outside of Nazareth that said, Hometown of Jesus the Messiah. Because they were so proud that Jesus was coming to visit them, including his own family. Now, that's not how the story went, is it? Jesus went to Nazareth, somebody said, Jesus is here, and everybody said, who dat? And Jesus' own family, process this for a minute, Jesus' own family rejected him and didn't believe in him. Now see right there, for probably every single one of us, if we were in Jesus' sandals and that happened to us, right there is the moment where we plant the seed for bitterness to grow in our lives. My own family doesn't believe in me. My own family doesn't support me. And we would grow bitter. But Jesus didn't do that. You know, flying under the radar of this story in the Bible is Jesus being willing to practice what he preaches. And what did Jesus preach? He preached forgiveness to everyone. I have to assume that Jesus forgave everyone in Nazareth, including his family, for not believing in him. Because the very next part of uh, that, that story is Jesus just continues. He leaves town and he continues ministering. He continues doing what he was called to do, casting out demons, healing the sick, preaching the kingdom of God. He even empowers his disciples and sends them out into ministry. Jesus wasn't held back by that. Jesus didn't let bitterness grow in, in his heart. What about you? We're told in Hebrews chapter 12 that we are to not let the root of bitterness grow among us. Bitterness is a killer. It really is. Bitterness is what causes us, I believe, to grow old in our faith and not grow up into our faith. So how do we grow in our faith. Well, this is where we're going to talk about applying the Scripture. Um, Travis, if you'll help me here, I think I, I'm frozen up here. To our lives. So you should all have an insert in your bulletin. Did everybody have an insert in your bulletin? This is a, a list of the spiritual disciplines. And if you've never heard about the spiritual disciplines, you're not sure about this, there's probably a good chance that you already practice some of these things. This is just giving a name to these things that we do as followers of Jesus. And so I want to just walk through some of these things on here so you have kind of an understanding of what these disciplines are. And then I want to show you how this helps us apply what Peter has been teaching this church in the first century. So we start with the inward-focused disciplines. These are really disciplines of the mind. And the first is meditation. 
Meditation is simply taking a scripture. It can be just one verse. It can be even a word in a verse. And just... You ever see a dog, you know, with a bone that they like? I don't know if you've seen that. Some of you are cat, cat people. I'm sorry. I'm praying for you. But us dog people, you know, we give our dogs a bone, and sometimes they just take that bone and they just chew on it. They, they, they hold it. They just savor it. They just take it with them wherever they go. That's like what meditation is when it comes to talking about this as a Christian discipline. Now, Eastern meditation is differently th- different than Christian meditation. Christian meditation, we're attempting to empty our minds in order to fill it, fill it with God's Word. That's meditation. Then there's the discipline of prayer. Many of you know what prayer is. You practice prayer. prayer. You are a praying church. This is talking to God, listening to God, sharing our burdens with God, whatever's going on in our life, just pouring out our hearts to Him. giving up breakfast, lunch, or dinner, and spending the time that we normally would spend eating, reading the Word, talking to God, praying. Then there's a discipline of study. This is where we are reading and thinking on the Bible and what it has to say. We're asking God to speak to us through the Holy Spirit and the writings and teachings of other Christians. I'm all for using the Bible to study the Bible, but I do feel like if that's all you ever do, you, you will miss out on some things because there are things in the Bible that we don't always understand 2,000 years later living in a completely different culture. And there are people that have devoted their lives to studying the culture uh, of the Old Testament, to studying the culture of the first century. disciplines, things that we do. And I want to let you know that we have a class going on right now. It's on Wednesday nights at 7 p.m., and it's all the month of July. And Roger's there. Roger, would you just kind of wave at everybody to know who you are? Roger is teaching on these outward disciplines. He's just started this class. If you're looking for something to do on Wednesday nights, I encourage you to come and check this out. But the outward disciplines are things that we are engaging in, things that we are doing, like simplicity. I I love the idea of simplicity. It's very appealing. It's one of those things that's very hard also to put into practice. With simplicity, we're purging our lives uh, of everything that's unnecessary or excessive in order to depend on God rather than material luxuries. That's simplicity. There's solitude, where we get away, we Go off by ourselves to be alone with God and in His presence. There's submission, where we practice obedience to God and those He has placed in spiritual authority over us. Those of you that have gone through my membership classes, you know there's a part in there where I teach on the importance of submission when it comes to membership. Because it's a way that we say we are in and that we aren't, uh, you know, the source of truth and that, you know, we should be able to submit to one another because as Christians, we're all to be submitted to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. And if we claim that we are submitted to Him who we can't see, but at the same time we have trouble submitting to those around of us who we can see, how submitted are we to Jesus the last outward focus discipline. Doing things that influence and ha- have an effect on others. And then finally, on that back side of that paper, there's the corporate disciplines. They're called corporate because it involves the body coming together to do these things. The first one is confession. Now, you might read that and say, well, it talks about, you know, going and asking God to forgive our sins. What does that have to do with the rest of the body of Christ? Well, we can still do those kind of things together as a body of Christ. As a matter of fact, it's always encouraging to me as a follower of Jesus when there's somebody who's further along than me that owns up to their sin, that confesses something and wants to grow in the Lord. 
And think about it. What did John the Baptist do to get everybody ready for the Messiah? He went out into the wilderness. Confessing their sins. Confession, it's a great discipline. Great discipline. So freeing. The next one there is worship. We do this every Sunday at 10.30 a.m. And we have been very diligent about making this a big, uh, very important matter for Northside that we are going to gather every week and we are going to focus on Jesus. We're going to worship Jesus. We're going to do this through prayer. We're going to do this through singing. We're going to do this through opening up the Word. We're going to do this by engaging the sacraments. We're going to do this. We're going to be committed to doing this in a group of people. That's what worship is. Guidance is seeking the wisdom of someone who's more spiritually mature than you. Going to them and asking them, hey, I'm in this situation, I need some help. Enjoying fellowship with your family, with your friends and community by celebrating your love for God and each other. You know, the truth of the matter is when it comes to celebration, we, we don't need to really think of reasons to have a fellowship time together because we already have reasons. We already have a reason in Jesus Christ and everything that he's done for us. We can celebrate that every single week by having a fellowship time together. But that is a list of the spiritual disciplines, the things that will help us to be effective for the kingdom of God, which in turn help us to be a part of a healthy church. Now here's what I want to show you, church. These disciplines provide an indirect way for us to fulfill Moral excellence, goodness. How are we going to know what's morally excellent? How are we going to know what's good? Now, if we say, well, you know, Jesus is good. Well, what do you know about Jesus? And so the discipline of study comes to mind here. Because we could study the life of Christ. We can read one of the Gospels. We can read all four of the Gospels to learn about how Jesus lived and look to Him as our example in each and every situation we find ourselves in. Knowledge. Again, study increases our knowledge. Prayer. Also, because there's that relational side to knowing God. It's not just information, it's a relationship with Him. And meditation, keeping His Word before us, thinking. Self-control. Prayer, of course. God, help me. I want to punch this person, help me. Anybody ever prayed that prayer? But fasting. Also, fasting. You, you may wonder, well, how in the world does fasting help us with self-control? Well, think about it. When we fast, we are telling our body no to something. Because we have that hunger. Some of you right now, I know, I've seen it. You're doing little sneaky peeks at your watch. You're like, man, it's been an hour, Tim. Come on, I'm getting hungry. All right, we're fasting when those desires come up. When we fast, we practice telling our desires no. And if we can learn to do that with just one meal a day, I think God helps us to be able to do that in life situations where we all of a sudden... We really need to practice the discipline of fasting. I mean, think about self-control and how out of control people are. I mean, I was just reading a story about, you know, someone got, someone had their order messed up at McDonald's, and so they pulled a gun on the person. They thankfully didn't shoot them, but they pulled a gun on them because they messed up their food order. Confession, too, as well, can help. You know, when we bring things into the light, that is when we can start to experience God's healing power. But it's not going to come into the light if we're not willing to confess it. Look at the other ones. Patient endurance. That's worship. 
every week we gather, we are focused on Jesus. We're waiting on Jesus. We're thinking about Jesus. I think that is... Solitude, sometimes detaching ourselves from the stuff around us, sometimes detaching ourselves from our phone. We can learn what God wants when it comes to holiness. We can learn to rely on Him and to trust Him in those moments. Brotherly affection, simplicity. I mean, think about it. Think about the ways you might be able to help the people around you if you were to live on less or if you were to share your resources. How could you help your brothers and sisters in need? And then love, a great way to fulfill the loved one is to serve. And to do no limit serving. Do things for people that they will never know about. Do things for people that don't like you. That we are going to grow up in our faith. Do you want to grow, church? Do you want to mature, church? Would you bow with me? I want to just take a couple of moments here just to allow you to just reflect, to think about the words of Scripture that you've heard, and then I'm going to close us with a blessing from Second Peter. Jesus, we thank you for these words in this letter. We thank you for your faithful servants that followed you to the end. We thank you for someone like Peter and for the things that he writes here to challenge us and to spur us on in the faith. I pray that we will strive to grow up. It's in your name I pray this. Amen. Church, would you stand with me? And my blessing... It's going to be the last two verses of this section that we looked at here in Second Peter. We're going to be back next week. Um, I don't know if it's just a... Okay, because I'm going to be preaching on the end times. That's going to be fun. As long as Jesus doesn't come back between now and then. Receive this blessing. So, dear brothers and sisters... Work hard to prove that you really are among those God has called and chosen. Do these things, and you will never fall away. Then God will give you a grand entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. You are blessed in the name of Jesus. Go and have a wonderful Sunday afternoon. God bless.